was a great solo. So where is God? Where's the place of God? Where's the church? Where do we encounter the divine? Where is the real God at work? Is it only in the hallowed walls of monasteries and abbeys and churches and cathedrals? Or is God at work in the places of our daily labor? Listen. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from Luke 5, 1 to 11. Luke 5, 1 to 11. Let us listen to the words of God. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him near the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and told the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, to, speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let it down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then said Jesus to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. I think people have always been keen on confining the deity to a safe place. That is, a place where people will be safe. For many people's deities were dangerous and had to be appeased. Locating deities in the temples and mountaintops and special tents was a way to protect the people from the harsh and dangerous action of the deities. Even our language of God expresses us, expresses fear. How often do we read, the fear of the Lord is good for us in Scripture? And yet that word actually is better translated as awe. Even so, awe is an experience that sets us back away, makes us perhaps a little timid. Over and over again, we use the church to patch, package God in ways that take away the fear and awe of the divine. We domesticate God to a set of doctrines and rules and practices and sacrifices that allow us to do, that the, to do life as though we're protected from God. God does not interfere in our daily lives. We can make God an intellectual matter, 
something of cool logic rather than a raw encounter. We can make God into something so safe that no con it has no consequences in our daily lives. And then we decide there is no God because, well, there's just this weak image. But what if God is actually really wherever we happen to be? What? If God is right here where we work, out in what people call the secular world. I suspect that when Moses led the Hebrew people through the desert for 40 years, in part it was to train the people of God that God is indeed with them even in the desert. That God wants to be with us and to share our lives. And Jesus, far from pointing to a God who is so hidden and dis in a distant temple or a mountaintop, shows us again and again that God is right here with us in our daily lives, from the smelly fishing boat to the kitchen table. So when Jesus meets up with Simon Peter, James, and John after they've had an unsuccessful night of fishing, he shows them that God is in fact with them in their frustration, with them in their boat. He shows them that God is with them. And this is the mark of God's presence in Jesus, that we encounter God in our daily, ordinary, common life. And in the people where we work and labor and do all the daily tasks of life. His stories and parables are mostly about common people doing ordinary things, everyday sorts of things, rather than confined in some rarefied place. The kingdom of God is not, according to Jesus, far off from our daily lives. The kingdom of God is where we are. It is at hand. It is present. It is just under the surface of things where we are in our daily lives. Whether you're working to make things or service things or help people, Jesus is right there. Whether you're working in an office or a factory, a field or a mine, Jesus is present with you. Whether you're in school or in a nursing home, Jesus is with you. This is radically different from what many people who have no belief in God would have us believe. It's not what a lot of us who do believe want either. It messes up our neat categories and places God right where we live. Not in some distant place. So my friends, where have you experienced God's presence lately? Do we think God's been on vacation? Did he go to Florida for the winter? Arizona, Hawaii, I don't know. No. God has been right here with us, wherever we are. Where have you been touched by light, by love, by divinity, by just the hint of something beyond understanding that's with you? Where have you been made alive Where, when you felt dull and depressed and washed out? Where has love interrupted your orderly ways? Where has something unknown slipped into your consciousness unbidden? Where has music come in to the cacophony of daily life? Where has something touched you 
from beyond. As you walk down the hall of a hospital or a nursing home or entered a business or a shop or climbed aboard a truck to head out to work, have you sensed that God was traveling with you? That God's love was with you? If we but pay attention, we notice these wondrous blessings. You know, paying attention is hard. I recently had lunch, breakfast with my wife. We try to do this often. I'm looking at my wife, and I noticed a little advertiser right there next to her. And my eyes drifted down, and I read the headline, and she noticed. I was in deep trouble. <laughs> yeah. I really was paying attention. Yes, yes, well. We don't pay attention very well to God. We pay, don't pay attention to each other. We don't pay attention to the good that is present in the world. And frankly, if I listen to the news or my feed, I'm pretty well disgusted with it. It doesn't sound very good. And I could easily listen to the depressing parts of my person, personality come out and complain about things all the time. Or I could start to pay attention to where God is in my wife, in my friends, in my enemies, in the sunshine, in the music, in the unexpected thing that happens. Yes, God is with us. And so like Simon Peter, once we notice that God is with us, we can be overcome with sort of shame and guilt. We realize that we're not good enough. Hmm? Had that experience? You suddenly feel ashamed. There's something about us that just goes, oh, no, I'm really... And you know, it's kind of the devil that's whispering in your ear all the crap about you, right? The stuff you know but don't want to brag about. It's not on your Facebook page, right? And he comes to us and we go, oh, it couldn't be God because I'm not really that good. But friends, it is God. And like Jesus to Peter, it is, no, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't fall into that trap of feeling like crap all the time when God wants you to know that you are beloved of God. That God loves you, warts and all. All right? So there's nobody perfect here except my spouse, and even she may not be perfect at times, but I'll let her choose when that moment is. Right? We're not perfect. We all have our troubles. We might sense, you know, that God knows our sexual fantasies, our material desires, our angers and irritations at others, our uncharitable judgments of people, our hard-heartedness and callousness, our selfishness, our whininess. Yeah, God knows all about that and still loves us. It is good. God is there for you every day. Jesus responds with love and engagement to, Saint, to Peter, Simon, not judgment. So why are you busy judging yourself? I mean, self-judgment has its place. I mean, you know, it helps us to make some corrections as we go along. But when it weighs us down, when it tells us we're worthless, when it gives us, takes the hope away from us, it's not what God wants. Jesus wants us to know, oh, I love you, and I have work for you to do to share this love with other people. 
And that's what he does with these fishermen. You know, they're saints, right? And we go, oh yes, they're so perfect. Really? If we carefully, if we read the scriptures with an open mind, we're, we're, I'm always convinced these guys are idiots, just like me. They're idiots. And Jesus chose them. And Jesus sent them out to do the work of the kingdom. So if he chose those idiots, why not us idiots? Jesus' love can work through anything. So how might Jesus repurpose you? He took a bunch of fishermen and made them fishers of people. How might Jesus repurpose you? What is it that God is going to do with you that leads to doing something new? Might the nurse become the healer of worn and torn souls? Might the craftsman become the builder of kingdom life? Might the engineer design new ways of sharing grace, new structures of common life? Might the cook feed the soul as well as the stomach? Might we all find that new calling that God has for us in our daily lives? Not to be perfect, not to be holier than thou, but to move with God that the kingdom might be revealed where we live, where we work, through our daily lives, imperfect as we are. Thanks be to God. Amen.